I think everyone probably knows me, but I'm Alice Pazinis, Harriet's daughter. Before and after my Harriet's is October 14, 2019. What is before? What is after? What is then? What is when? Ah, time that goes on and on. An eternal manifestation of the Earth's continuity. This was one of my mother's last poems, written just before, just weeks before she died. It so succinctly points to her lifelong love of life and constant asking of questions. It also is the last collaboration between my mother and me as it sat alongside one of my drawings for my New Year's card this year. My mother and I had collaborated for decades with my making paintings inspired by her poems and she putting my artwork on her book covers. I also read and critiqued her many art reviews, although I must say she rarely listened to my suggestions. <laughs> my mother was my role model, my mentor, a force to gain inspiration from, a force to work against, and a force of which to measure my own accomplishments. But she set a high bar for me to follow. Cleaning out her apartment this last year for more than 5,000 books, of which many were inscribed very warmly by some of the most important writers of the past 75 years, and her files and files of correspondence, I discovered just how much my mother had been in the center of the poetry world. Sadly, many of her friends and colleagues could not be here tonight, for, not surprisingly, since Harriet was 100 years old, many have died, are too old to travel, or have simply moved away from New York City. And I may add, the coronavirus has, has scared away quite a number of people, including Rachel Ross, Harriet's great grandniece, and for whom Harriet had been a lifelong inspiration. Rachel had planned to fly from Chicago to sing a song in honor of her great grand aunt, but because in two weeks, Rachel will celebrate her bat mitzvah, she's just 13, um, <laughs> she didn't want to take the chance of being quarantined. Daniela Giuseppe, who was planning to read a poem and short story by Harriet, has the flu, but this is not the coronavirus, and, and so will not be here either. I therefore especially thank all of you for your presence and am grateful for the many deeply moving condolence letters I have received. I would like to read one now to give a sense of the words I have received almost daily since Harriet died on November 30th. Rachel Ra writer Rachel Simmons, excuse me, writer Rachel Simpson writes, Simmons writes, thank you so much for sending me a notification about your mother's passing in memorial service. As the moving, informative, lively Colorado obituary says, everyone loved her, and that would certainly include me. I met Harriet at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts in 1989 while working on what became my first book and visited her several times in the next decade. Each of those visits has fixed itself in my memory with her smile, her laughter, her passion for life and men and literature, her excellent taste in design and art. I remember having lunch in her apartment and remarking on her extraordinary silverware and her sprinklings of wisdom. Once when we met in the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria, just before my first book came out, I told her I was sad about being done with it. And she said, ah, yes, there's nothing like a first book. It's like a first boyfriend. Mm -hmm. You will never love the same way again. <laughs> <laughs> I have told that to so many other first-time authors over the years and all found comfort and enlightenment in the analogy. Harry never told me her age, saying, oh, a woman never reveals that. I see now that when we met, she was 70, much older than I would have guessed, considering her spirited physicality and indelible joie de vivre. She spoke of love and lust and lovers and art, her friendship with Anis Nin, her loss of your father. Tears came as she recounted his sudden passing. I've never forgotten that. And her love of her children. 
When I read her books, knowing you're all of them, what an extensive body of work. I was captivated by the power and urgency of her voice, the rigor and flow of her poetic narratives, the intensity of life itself as she worked into every piece. And then Rachel goes on, and this is why she can't be here. I would like to thank Poets House for opening its doors to this memorial, especially as it usually is an open Saturday night and for its gracious help in the preparations. A special thank you goes to Valentin Conady, without whose got patience with my many questions and her helpful answers, this service could not have been organized. And I'd like to thank everyone who was here tonight to celebrate the memory of my mother. Last year, the extended family came from across the country and around the world to celebrate Harriet's 100th birthday. And we were able to tell her directly how important she had been for each of us, each in very different ways. Tonight, therefore, we'll focus on Harriet the poet and writer, though of course my brother, Harriet's son Clifford, will also speak. Also, the music we heard just now as you were coming in, and the music after the service, that would be as you walk upstairs to the reception that we have afterwards. Um, that music were all pieces that my father played. My father was a physicist, but also a trained concert pianist. My dad played the piano, my memory says, just about every night. And I suspect his and Harriet's shared love of music was one of the initial attractions between the two of them, and also one of the bonds that held them together until his death long ago. Uh, tonight's music, though, was not played by him, it was played by others. Um, so we are going to start the actual service with a video of Harriet reading right here, right at this spot, <laughs> at Poet's House during her 2012 book launch of Weather is Weather, um, introduced by Thomas Fink, who will actually speak a little later in the service. Um, please excuse, it's a typo, it's my fault, that it says 2005 on the video, but it was 2012. Thank you. Facts. Harriet Zivis, Professor Emerita of English at the City University of New York, is the author of five books of poetry, a collection of prose poems, two books of short stories, the critical volume Ezra Pound and the Visual Arts, and a translation of Jacques Prévert's poetry, as well as many publications in journals such as the Denver Quarterly and the Holland's Critic. The homonymic title of the new book, Weather is Weather. You all know how to spell those two things. <laughs> Tells us something about Harriet's poetics. She's most interested not just in tell us, telling us, but in showing us how every process in the natural world and in the emotional weather of human beings is subject to the conditional weather, to contingency, flowering, disruption, decay, cessation, resumption. For Harriet, and I quote, the solidity of objects is a query, end quote. It is not an abiding certainty. And to do justice to the conditional as she experiences it, the poet verbally paints impressions of time, knowing that time is uncanny, uncapturable. Like T.S. Eliot, W.B. Yeats and Wallace Stevens, three poets whose stately cadences, heightened speech, and elegant uses of repetition, but not patriarchal qualities, have been profitably absorbed in Harriet's work. <clears throat> she takes the interplay <clears throat> of epiphanic energy <clears throat> excuse me, and poetic philosophical speculation on the temporal as a means to tap core saliences of lyric poetry in the Western tradition. In the title poem, she declares, quote, here in the now that is not yesterday is the tomorrow that will appear more as a ghost than as a sunrise, quote. Further, fascinated by both the apparatus of coherence that establishes individual selves and the teeming heterogeneity that problematizes them. She probes the wilderness within, 
as part of that isness so vast that all contexts are absorbed by it. Let us welcome Harriet Innes. Rocks and stones. 
Silence is the word sealed behind the lips. It is a hideaway, a lone wolf behind the tree in the forest. Silence is a wound uncared for. It bleeds without emission. Secret Knowledge is the next poem. There in the wilderness, I am not. And yet, and yet, there is a wilderness within where darkness and strange animals roam. When will you visit the wilderness? Oh no, you have already been a visitor. And as I received you, you too engaged the darkness watched the strange animals, and left with a secret knowledge that now we both share. In the last poem, I hear the church bells ringing. I hear the church bells ringing. I see a cow in the pasture. I know the sun will lower and the moon will rise. on the highways roll. Soldiers in Afghanistan are alert. The world is a dynamo of war. Suffering has no end. China, the United States, poles apart. Ambassadors, ambassadors meeting, confrontations. The United Nations, oh, peace, oh. Why is history demonic and fragile? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're next going to hear my brother Clifford say something. Yeah, I'll mirror or echo my sister's words. Thank you all for coming. I was, I was quite concerned with the incredible efforts my sister made that there might not be a, a critical mass, but you more than fulfill that. And I thank you all for coming from all over. And some of you really have come from all over. Um, you know, I, I'm addling a little here, but you know, when my mother, after my mother passed away, it's hard to be uh, upset when somebody has lived that many years in good health, you know. Um, and uh, I, you know, obviously, the, the, the day it happened, it was dramatic, but you know, over time, I felt she was still with us. And so I, it didn't really hit me as strongly maybe as it might, but just listening to her poetry now, it's <laughs> blows me away. Um, I guess I thought what I would do is just say a few personal words, since there are many of you who, who have a lot of professional insights that I, I lack. Um, I just want to say that um, as much I'd like to um, give thanks for, for, for my mother. Um, I guess the most important is uh, I was born. <laughs> I, I guess I was <laughs> over getting gratitude for that. Um, but also, more seriously, um, exposing me to art. You know, I come from a more analytic side and exposing me to art, not just art, but artists. Many of them are here. I, I you know, I'm afraid to name all of them that are here, but I, I can certainly, besides my sister, obviously, uh, mention uh, Yorgi Kostanescu, which, uh, and and his wife Sylvie, and I know there are many, many others of you here that uh, that are in the part, and I, I really, we all appreciate your gifts. And, and by the way, if you want to say, um, uh, due to an oversight. Um, Georgi's name is not Constantinescu, but Kostinescu, and I apologize for missing that, um, you know, where Microsoft Word's Romanian uh, spell check is just not what it used to be. You know? um, I also want to say that, you know, my mother was a real example um, to all of us, uh, you know, both inside and outside of the family. Um, any of us have raised children, it's, it's obviously a miracle that you could have such a rich professional life and still raise two children who are not completely weirded out. Um, maybe uh, you'll take exception, I don't know my kids will. Um, but also, you know, to, to, to grow up with a woman, a uh, mother who's a professional and who 
women to live and all that stuff, you know, you, 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 I'm glad to have had that formation when I entered the modern world. Um, and um, she also exhibited uh, incredible perseverance in the face of, you know, um, setbacks, you know, being in arts, you all probably know very well, uh, not everybody's equally enthusiastic about your work as, as you'd like them to be, and so it doesn't always get published immediately, and you get, re quote, rejections, uh, which unfortunately also happens in my field. Um, but uh, she just persevered. It was as if it just didn't, you know, we talked about the Teflon president, the Teflon poet, you know, she just didn't stick to her. She just went right on along and as if it never happened. And uh, in fact, that perseverance really went beyond um, her professional life. But he, I remember, I mean, the night before she died, she walked up a flight of stairs with me to go to bed. At 100 years old, 100 and a half, she was walking up a flight of stairs every night. I, I didn't carry her, and I was obviously near her to make sure she wouldn't fall, which she never did. Um, but it's that, it's that innate perseverance that anyone know, knew her knew that she had, so I thought I would just use that little example. Um, and um, also, um, you know, as a child, you, you need your parents, you know, you need to feel that they're there. And, you know, some of us mature more quickly than others, uh, it took a long time, and um, I may not be there yet, but um, I can say that having your mother with you this long really, uh, you know, provided a psychological backstop, even, you know, just by her being there, so I really appreciated that. And, um, you know, preventing that, pr providing that parental sort of support for so long. Um, obviously, I have to thank her for what appears to be uh, genetic good health. I'm, you know, in my mid-60s, and I, I'm still able to do a lot of things that my kids uh, seem not to want to be or can't do anymore. Although, like aside, Sebastian drove me into the snow drifts. <laughs> he skied all around me, but uh, anyway. Um, and of course, last and certainly not least, you know, uh, my mother gave us all some incredible poetry, and um, you know, um, in many fields of sciences, natural uh, as well as uh, social, there's a tendency to complicate things. You know, because life's complicated. Well, you know, listening to that poetry, it's like you know, again, I'm not an economist, so you know, I, I don't have your insights into the arts, but for me, it just you know, it was the skeletal essence of ideas that. Just you know, it's like punching you right in the face, you know. When I listen to this again, it's 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 so simple and yet so complicated and profound that I I really like that, you know. It's what we all strive for: simplicity but coverage, you know. Um, I know I'm going on and on, but you know, what can I do? I paid for this room and I don't want to use it. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm grateful for a lot of things. Um, I'm not sure what the difference is between being thankful and being grateful, but I'll leave it to the, uh, to the writers to figure that one out. Um, first of all, um, you know, I had the unusual pleasure, or, or privilege, I should say, I'm not sure it was always a pleasure, to share my mother's final two years. She lived with me, and uh, you know, we were roommates in a way, and um, you know, um, sort of interesting, uh, at the beginning of our lives, she took care of me, and at the end of the life, I took care of her. So, you know, there's certain pleasant symmetry to these things. Um, and um, I'm also very, very grateful that my mother had the longevity to be able to meet uh, Luca, my, my daughter's, uh, our daughter's uh, fiance, and Layla, um, my, 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 uh, my partner in life. And, um, and in fact, I was just thinking about this. Um, anyone who knows my mother knows how much she loved jewelry. And um, so, you know, we're sitting at the dining room, the kitchen table, and, and, and you know, my mother and Layla are talking. And my mother looks at Layla's wrist and says, what's that? That's nice. Looking at her, her bracelets, you know? Layla, of course, being a very generous person, said, here, it's yours. She gave her a silver bracelet. 
My mother, from that moment on, never took it off. It was her favorite piece of jewelry. And the reason I mention this is, I don't think I told you this a little bit. The day she died, you know, I took the bracelet off. <laughs> it broke. Jesus. You know, it's pretty weird, you know. It was a, it was a lot of little, um, a lot of little square um, pieces of silver. And they were an elastic or something. So it was kind of, you know, as a, as a statistically minded person, there was a probability that would happen, but I, I still like the, uh, the the negative serendipity, if you want to call it that. But I thought I would share that silly thing. Um, and um, another thing about living with her those final years is I learned a little bit about how she wrote, which was really <laughs> idiosyncratic to say the least. She would get up in the middle of the night with a completely written poem and have to go to the desk and write it down. Now, for most of you, that's okay. That, you know, I don't know. At 99, 100 years old, you remember a whole poem. For someone who has trouble remembering whether her granddaughter lives in Singapore or St. Louis um, or anything else that begins with a letter of the alphabet, but you know, she remember the whole poem. She write it down. And um, um, the funny thing is, and is that in the morning, nobody could read it. Um, and you know, her handwriting made hieroglyphics look lucid. I mean, even she couldn't read it. <laughs> and so we always have this great struggle the next day to work for quite a considerable amount of time to figure out what it is she really wrote. And, what was interesting, and I do it in a statistical way, because, you know, I'd have her read it several times to take the average, because she never, it was never the same poem twice, you know? Um, and my sister had been alluded to that, but it was very frustrating, because I'd say, Mom, why don't you just bloody well read the poem one time to yourself after you've written it, and make sure you can read it? But she never wanted to look at the poem again. It was, I, we have arguments about what psychologically that means. Alice said, you know, she would make a suggestion, and I noticed it, no. It reminded me of, you know, Charles de Colbert, by the way, Gorky, who's, who, uh, uh, I think it was his uh, violin concerto. Um, I forget who, who premiered it, but the gentleman, who was obviously a superb Russian violinist, went over to, to Dimitri and said, you know, this is unbelievable music, but that just one little spot on the violin, you could just change it a little bit, it would go much better. And, and, what they have said, it was reported, reputed to have said, that's a wonderful idea. I'll save it for my next piece. <laughs> my mother was somewhat the same way. She wouldn't change a word, even if it made totally nonsense to me. You know, like, like you know, uh, well, I won't take her examples. So, um, um, yeah, so let's see. Um, finally, um, I'd like to say that um, I'm very grateful to my mother these final years for bringing my sister and I closer to Glad Gather because, you know, we live apart, we're in different lives, we're in different places, and, you know, it took me a while to get over the, uh, what's it called, um, uh, filial uh, jealousy or whatever, whatever it is. That, huh? Sibling rivalry, right, right. Maybe I always wanted to be a painter, I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> I think my mother brought that, uh, she got us over that by working together to keep my mother uh, on the right, uh, the right pill set. Um, and, um, yeah. So, and then finally, I just want to end by saying again, Alice, you did an unbelievable job throwing this together. I wish I could say I helped, but um, all I can say is I did the 100th and the 90th, so you could do the posthumous. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next we'll hear from Thomas Fink, who you heard a little bit in the, as introducing my mother in the video. Tom is the uh, poet himself, but also is the person behind, who edited the selected poems, chose the poems for that book. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed working with Harriet and Alice on the selected poems. It was a great pleasure. And uh, it made me discover some of Harry's earlier work, which became some of my favorite. 
Loom fever. One warp worries woof, wantonly worrying myriad wefts of loops and threads. See where the quilt rises vermilion. And the warp and woof weave drunkenly over old sullen clothes and cloths that spelled weariness and why and where and why won't you cover me? My canvas is blood red and my soft folds of linen ache to be worn as woolly weave of warp and woof. Word as gesture. The simple word rests flat on the page. Page reads the word back to me. As it rests, I rest, both in the oblivion of having been, having been expressed. What simple gesture do I now demand when the ink runs dry and the boat sinks beneath the water and the smile submerges in the tomb and the weak voice utters that last cry? I have been, I die. That silent stone, that block of time, the immemorial gesture of, I have been, I die. And this is an analogy for John F. Kennedy. And some of us are old enough <laughs> to remember that day he died. It is well known. It is well known. It is dangerous. Temptation is irresistible. The center holds the black round eye. The path is hard. Error is everywhere. The canvas is light blue. Who torments the child with a McGuffey reader and tears the canvas at its black throbbing center? The page is white and the president is dead. He speaks. Below the burrowing Bosporus, betwixt between betroth the twenty furbelow tirade, bespeaks my true love Loth. Bespeak the bones below the boss, be turned, be twist, be spoken. Be sure the door is barred, be locked. Be sure it is not broken. Oh well, the whirling welkin woe of what wherefore beehive. Oh, slowly sloughs the slovenly. Contess, control, contrive. She did a series of numbers that was a chat book. This is 13. Through the turnstile, take the top terrace twisting turn, tending towards the torrents, tearing twine like through thickets thirstily. Thickly thumping, tumbling, toad-like through ways, total terrors, tempting, teasing, teenagers, teetotalers, you taught through thick, thin, through torrid temperatures, timetables, telegrams, telltale tormentors, torturers, tarrying too tardily, telling tales through the twilight, taking tenderly to Telemann, Tacitus, Thompson, Thackeray, Titian, Twain, Tintoretto, Thoreau, Turner, Tennyson, Thomas, Theocritus, Tolstoy. <laughs> Thirteen talents time throws. Thus, 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 temporarily tilts to timeless tisk tisk. <laughs> this is a great uh, one of her books uh, before her Marshall time is called My Haven't the Flowers Been. I think that's a great title. Um, this is a poem from that book called, uh, it's 1996, a poem from that book called Fugitive. Fugitive, like the hummingbird, even the waters flow principles. And when the paper tests rests without words, who is to say who is happy? Has the viewer created the vacuum? Or the lover hiding, has he? Let him deliberate. He is deliberate. Suctionless, he will not appear. He will take journeys by air, not on foot, precipitate. When the receiver is off the hook, how happy he is, free, fugitive. To make a statement, he will use his facts, the machine, the cover-up. 
how sweet the migration of birds, safety in numbers. He, the isolate one, does he know his division? During the war, he was estranged as if he were in a foreign legion, fugitive, restrained. But the battle went on. It always does. Death is a muddle. Uncanny, those humming birds, fugitive, in hope, spring or winter, equally. I'll do one more. <coughs> Dissection. What if each moment had hidden parts to be broken down? <coughs> so closely connected the parts would be that only a piercing, invisible thought would be able to break each one of them. Let us say that the parts were divided into colors. Red, blue, violet, ultramarine, green, and umber. Anyone who wanted to live a moment fully would have to experience each of the hidden colors. And all very quickly, at the very moment of the moment experienced in time. It would be a rapid mental dissection. Each color would appear successively, followed by the encroachment of the next color, but not mixed with the color. No, never mixed. What? a fracturing. A moment would then be an act of perception, a sensuous perception of some curvature of a formal experience of space resolved into time, broken down into geometric appearances. As color broke into color, sensuosities experienced starkly, cubistically, all time, edgy resistant to cohesion. Thank you so much, Tom, for reading us really beautifully, really, really beautifully. And Alice, we should mention that books are available. Yes, yes, so if you hadn't noticed on the table in the back, and then again, it'll be upstairs for reception, uh, we are so happy about it. You know, Poets House is such an amazing institution and very supportive to my mother, but supportive to poets, just really, really supportive to poets in every way you can ever imagine. And so we are asking that in lieu of flowers for people to donate to Poets House. And as a thank you gifts, please take books. Um, we have books at the table, and again, we'll have them upstairs. And, you know, all the poems that Tom and everyone else has read will be in them. Uh, so next we're going to hear from Georgie, Yorgi Kostinescu, who as Puss said, I just spelled his name, I'm so sorry, Yorgi. Uh, he is a dear, dear friend of my mom's, um, I think that at McDowell, and um, Yorgi is going to introduce uh, something he wrote uh, that's just really appropriate, it's a, to the song of, of, from Goethe's Wanderer's Night Song, and the Lyrics, I think you're going to be translate for us. It's a beautiful piece of music. her poetry, and her sunny personality. When we were both fellows at the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire, I presented my music theater piece, the musical seminar, with Leonard Bernstein in the audience. I was at the piano, and Harriet brilliantly played the typewriter <laughs> in the John Cage section. Soon after, Bernstein graciously wrote a letter of recommendation that helped me obtain U.S. citizenship. Harriet was part of it. For today's memorial, I choose a song of mine, one of my shortest. 
but I think adequate to the occasion. Its text is a poem by Goethe entitled Wanderers Nachtlied. Me, sung in German, I will read Longfellow's English translation. Wanderers Night Song. Over all the hilltops is quiet now. In all the treetops hearest thou hardly a breath. The birds are asleep in the trees. Wait, soon like these thou too shalt rest. The performers are Jeremy Williams, tenor, and Paula Fan Pian. Beautiful piece, and um, you already sent it to me and said you thought it would be appropriate, and I listened to it. I, I just cried. Just, thank you, Yorgi. Um, next on the program is Danielle Giuseppe, who is going to read a poem and short story that she published in two different collections that uh, Daniela had edited. But uh, unfortunately, Daniela has the flu and um, not the coronavirus. Um, and so she's not here, so uh, she, I'm going to read uh, her poem, my mom's poem. Uh, Daniela sent a little uh, introduction that she wanted to be sure that I read. So this is what Daniela wrote for the introduction. Oops, that's too loud. Um, Daniela Giuseppe put this poem in her groundbreaking American Book Award winning anthology, Women on War. International Writings from Touchstone, Simon & Schuster, 1988, among great women authors of the world who were writing on issues of war and peace. Daniela is so sorry to be Ill, too ill to attend this memorial to read from this work of her longtime beloved friend, Harriet Sinis. So this is a poem my mom wrote. Wounds by Harriet Sinis. Love is, the love is the blood of a deep wound, but it is not the blood bursting from the shock of hand grenades. Be quiet, heart. You are only mortal, one single heart among hearts. You are not a stranger here. You are not an exile. Your stomach does not swell. You have eaten well today, had wine with your dinner, a drink before, and I see you now sipping Cointreau. 
But if your face is sad and your heart in grief, your paltry heart, so you have lost your love. Is it a wound that bleeds, that scars your face, amputates your leg? What war is that? Hmm. A love war. Shame. Are you forgetting the blood in Cambodia, South America, Nicaragua, the bloated bellies of Ethiopia, the American homeless who may not weep for love? You have the luxury of the loss of love. Let the blood of your wounds wash the blood of sufferers. Ah, love, you are with me now, as I remember exile, famine, war. Uh, next on the program was going to be Rachel Ross, my mother's great-great-niece, but she's not going to be here to sing so, um, because of the coronavirus. So we will hear from Bert Kimmelman, um, editor, poet, essayist, um, also part of the Mark Hosh community of wonderful writers that's published by mother, Bert Kimmelman. Thank you. Is, is. 
Lilacs bloom, the sea swirls, rivers dry up. Nothing that is annihilates what if. What if is a game, a game of longing and desire. If what is is not, the game is over. But what is is never over. Desire is a wilderness of dreams. Desire is the what if of turbulence and denial. Last poem. so much to be part of the service and so we're going to hear two short pieces that he wrote inspired by my mother's poetry uh, again the poems that my mom wrote that he was inspired by are in the program guide on the left of the program itself um, so Gal King's two poems two pieces of music on the poems The Gaze and Wings by Harry Sinis
they will may be blasphemous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, actually, uh, maybe like a like a musician adapting a piano piece uh, for um, another instrument, let's say the violin or the flute, doesn't a translator uh, compose a music of his own to 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 render uh, the, the spirit of the original piece? I wonder. Anyway, this uh, this uh, work of translation. Um, requires, well, it requires talent for sure, but it also requires um, humility, sensitiveness, and uh, and generosity. And um, and Harriet had all that. Plus, she also had the um, the capacity to to love and embrace the world and. Uh, you know, when I think of Harriet, my friend, I think of a, a woman in love, in love with life, in love with art, in love with words, language, and um, in love with Paris, uh, where she visited us, uh, me and my husband, uh, many times in the 1980s. And um, Harriet would, um, would uh, visit us in, uh, in June, usually. She would go to uh, the Hotel des Trois Continents uh, in the heart of the Latin Quarter. And uh, in the morning, I would go and get, a, uh, I would go and pick her up at the hotel. And uh, we would um, uh, walk along the River Seine, past Notre Dame, to the flower market. And we would talk about poetry for for hours. Uh, you know, Harriet was very much of a Parisian at that time. <laughs> and um, uh, she admitted having difficulty in translating uh, some poems of Jacques Prévert. And she was very, very open to, um, uh, to suggestions. And I was really glad to contribute to her work in a humble way. And I can remember she had, uh, she was struggling with um, a poem. Um, um, the poem was um, she, um, Grasse Matinée was the poem. And she had translated it, or shall I say renamed it, uh, Brunch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I said that one day, you know, Harriet, let us have a Jacques Prévert experience. <laughs> well, she was intrigued. And, <laughs> and I, I took her to um, one of those local cafes, far away from touristic places. And uh, there we were, standing by the counter, side by side with um, locals having a glass of red wine and puffing their good wine cigarettes. <laughs> and um, then I took one of those uh, hardboard eggs sitting on the counter and I tapped it on the tin counter to break the shell and, and I peeled the egg. And uh, uh, Harriet looked at me and then she did as I did. And then I had a bite of the egg. And after half a second of hesitation, she did the same. <laughs> and then I can remember uh, the, the gentle smile on her face when she said, oh my, this is it. And indeed, this was it. That is life giving meaning to words. And as she would put it, the pulse of life. And um, talking about this um, poem, let us go back to these first four lines that troubled her at first. 
Il est terrible. Le petit bruit de l'œuf dur cassé sur un comptoir d'étain. Il est terrible ce bruit quand il remue dans la mémoire de l'homme qui a faim. And this is Herod's voice now. It is terrible the tiny tap of the cracking of a high boiled egg on the tin counter. This sound is terrible when it stirs the memory of a man who is hungry. And um,
So uh, after which, if anyone wants to say anything at all, then open this up to the audience. Okay. And Mother's last public hearing, really. To be, to be, to be, not to be, not to be. But the sun still shines, the pale moon glows, and the earth churns and churns. My mother's reading from a computer. Oh, okay. She sits at the edge of a river and watches the water flow. Tea at trees around her. Birds fly in the bubble blue sky. White clouds are moving slowly. Here is the perfect world without war, without dissension, with only the sun, the moon, and the sky. Nothing lives. Nothing lives remains the same. All that is will change. All that is will not be. A day will turn to night, night to day, and suddenly there is an eternity. <laughs> this one is called The Wilderness Within. There is a wilderness within. It is a hidden secret. And as I sit beside you, I smile and smile and do not reveal the secret. <laughs> Out of void, water is not, country is not, the world is not, and only heaven and the stars remain, and what a natural bounty they are. What if? What if? What if not? What, what? Ah, the mystery of life. experience every time we went. Um, one of the, um, because like she was so into art and poetry, she taught me a lot about the city and she taught me that A, there's hundreds of museums all over the city, but there's actually only two restaurants, Le Bon Soup and Tank Pavilion. <laughs> I don't think, we've been probably been there over 
<laughs> way too many times. <laughs> I don't know, I'd be there and be like, wow, this is awesome. I love New York City. Italian food's great. Chinese food's awesome. <laughs> Only there was more than two restaurants. <laughs> I don't know, maybe dad does to take us somewhere else occasionally. <laughs> Water out of our comfort zone. But um, yeah, I was thinking just what a nice job to be able to have. Just people to think of a poem, write it down, and there you go, you're done for the day. If I could run a nine to five project manager construction company, then you could have gone a career path. But uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was happy that she was able to have just things come so naturally to her. Um, I guess since always growing up, you learn a lot of poetry in elementary school and middle school probably. I always realized when I read grandma's poems, these poems do not rhyme. Um, <laughs> is this, I don't know if she was actually good at poetry. But, um, <laughs> getting older, you realize I was actually began to learn a lot or learn a lot more from her poems. And I was like I actually thought about them much more and I like enjoyed them much more. So I thought that was cool. But I mean, I wish maybe threw in one or two rhymes for me, you know, just like so follow along. She uses way too many words I don't, I didn't know at the time, and not enough rhymes. So. <laughs> and then um, I was also thinking her 90th birthday party for the few here that were actually there. Huh? <laughs> There's this one story about her. And back in our house where the party was, we had a pool, or had a pool, and the pool was covered because it was like April, and we, it was not warm enough to go swimming yet. And it was like this really bouncy cover, something you definitely should not walk on. You should probably fall into the water. And Grandma, I don't know why she felt the need to do it, but she decided to trot right across this thing, and we all, like 50 of us, certain people there, were just like staring at her as she walks right over like this they doesn't even miss a step, walks completely onto the pool cover, walks right off without even falling. One of the most impressive balance feats I've seen in my life, probably. I should have put her like Cirque du Soleil after that. But, uh, that was pretty impressive. Was, um, I believe. Yeah, you're Yori, you tried doing the same thing that fallen. I'm sorry, I think you dropped the fork or something onto the cover. It didn't go so well for you. But, uh, yeah, so I think that's about it that I wanted to share. But yeah, so a lot of funny times were there, to say the least. <laughs> Esther, you may think that Grandma was the only one with the gift for words, but you do too. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Melanie and Lines, who I think of myself as her second aunt. I've known Mel since she was about seven years old. She's a wonderful, wonderful opera singer. A friend of mine recently wrote, um, it was more about current events right now, but was writing that we are all amplifiers. We are somehow amplifiers of whatever is there on the inside, whatever that might be. And we are no matter what, and it, maybe we should figure out you know, what it is that we are amplifying. And I've been thinking about that a lot, especially when it comes to art. Um, and uh, Alice and I have been very close since I was very little. And, um, and I didn't know Harriet very well, but what I have realized uh, recently, it was how similar her story is to my grandmother's, who was also a poet. And what I now know, I didn't know as a kid, but what I now know is that what made my grandmother exceptional and what made Harriet exceptional was that they really were who they are. And I read here at the end, it says, that flies into the world without, that is you and you and you. Um, and I can see when she is reading that she, you know, she sort of switches so quickly from the sort of personal to immediately into what is such a deep and true truth because she has chosen these words with whatever alchemy it is that comes and it becomes, it is equatable to her. You know, it is her. And you can see that when that happens. And I think that is what art in the end is, is that it is her, and I can just see that so much there, and it's very, and it's, it's, it's not even the same, you know, for some poems are made to be read, you know, and it, when you see someone in that way read it, you feel that sense of 
who she is. And I think, you know, my, my mother also is a person who is who she is because of my grandmother, but she's not an artist. And when I was very little, Alice showed up at our sawmill and I had someone of my, I'm a little younger, but of my mother's generation who was who she was and was an artist and that's something that you get when, you're, when your mom is who she is. <laughs> and so I'm really grateful to this woman that gave, you know, I didn't become a painter, but I became an artist and I, you know, it, it just, it is something that you can pass along, that amplification of who you are. Um, and that's what I would hope to do myself. So. Oh, okay. uh, thank you so much, Mel. Really, really, I, I like the idea of my mother passing something on to me and passing on to you and continuing to pass on our, our passion and belief in what's deeply human about us. Um, anyone else want to say anything? Mm -hmm. We've said so much. Um, Thank you, Alice. Okay, all right, well, we do have more munchies, different variety, upstairs, um, some more wine, and um, time to chat and enjoy and feel a little bit more my mother all around us and feel ourselves all around each other. And um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, just a reminder, we do have uh, the books of my mother's, uh, including the translation, it's called Blood and Feathers, um, so someone would know that as well. So thank you so much. It means I can't even begin to tell you how much it means to me that you know, to everyone in my family to see people come here despite this horrible virus and to come and be part of the memory of Harriet Sinis. Thank you.